So our next speaker is uh, Elsa Cannon, and she is here uh, from Lockheed Martin Space, um, and uh, she has a master's in Metallurgical and Materials Engineering from Colorado School of Mines, and a master's of um, Computer Science with a con concentration in Data Science from Colorado Technical University. And she's been with Lockheed Martin for quite a while, and she's been a senior research scientist. I don't know, quite a while. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, I was not. Sorry. Not quite a while. I saw it 2009. It's 2019. She's barely been there at all. <laughs> she, she succeeded so well. We finally found that fast forward button. Um, okay. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, as introduced, my name is Kelsey Cannon. Um, I'm a research scientist at Lockheed Martin Space. Um, I've worked closely with our stat subject matter expert, David Harrison, um, to take a discerning look at our current analysis techniques um, in relation to our vision um, and identify um, high level opportunities for improvement as it relates to um, an example I'll provide um, that is on missile trajectories. Uh, so to briefly go into Lockheed Martin space real quick, you all can see four key work areas there on the screen, um, but really I want this slide to show that um, space company doesn't necessarily only do space. Um, there's quite a bit of work um, and opportunities for analysis um, for systems on the ground, sea, air, near space, and deep space. <laughs> Um, okay, so the foundation to set for our missile trajectory example um, is a hypothetical situation where an analysis team is given, let's say, 725 Monte Carlo trajectories um, for thermal heating analysis. As it stands currently, um, a reduced order model would likely be used um, to evaluate the worst cases and then run those with the full model um, for handoff of predicted temperatures to the design team. Um, from there, it's also likely that within two to three months, another set of trajectories would be delivered to um, the analysis team, and then the entire process would rinse and repeat, um, which is illustrated by um, that what I'm going to call the decoder ring graphic, um, where um, hopefully it'll become clear in a second that um, we're going to question every step of this analysis process um, and try to identify opportunities to improve um, cost, schedule, and overall fidelity of the effort. Um, so as always, any program team to analysis team um, foundational stages um, really relies heavily on um, the foundational concepts of statistics and design of experiments. So making sure that um, our analysis teams are socializing things like, you know, rigorous means that if you give the same assignment to two different teams, they'll come up with plus or minus the same answer, um, or that test power means your ability to avoid false results. Test coverage is your ability to avoid um, people asking, like, did you try this afterwards? <laughs> Stuff like that. Um, and how all of these foundational concepts and educating on them sort of roll into experiments that program teams um, can really um, work better within. Um, and then they can move forward um, with more confident engineering decisions afterwards. Um, in terms of our current practices, um, those were covered by the hypothetical situation, um, but it's important to note a few different things. The first being that um, the, the time scale for analysis that I mentioned is roughly um, about a month, which it do, doesn't blow, blow anyone out of the water um, efficiency wise. Um, also, we don't necessarily want to miss a critical issue due to reliance on the low fidelity model. Um, and then the full model is only run on the worst cases, so we do not generate um, a full circuit or a map. Um, in addition, since the analysis process is currently iterative, what are we really learning or advancing every two to three months? Um, and then why are we not covering all possible trajectories at the start? So all of these risks or the gaps in the process, if you will, sort of point to our um, motivation or the need to improve. So advancing past that current process, which is at least an improvement from the common practice, um, is our ultimate vision of the best map of the 725 trajectories with a combination of low and high fidelity models 
based on test power coverage and generating the surrogate. Um, in order to approach that vision, we took a close look at what outputs we could potentially generate from any given input. Um, for example, provided with a factor table, an analysis team um, could theoretically output a space filling test design um, and a surrogate trajectory model. That happens to be identified as um, option number one on the screen. But we'll be going through all seven of those options. Um, it's also important to note that working um, below that uh, blue line signifies no longer working with a factor table as a direct input. Uh, so without further ado, um, the first assertion that option number one makes is that the customer should provide a factor table as opposed to a list of trajectories, which inherently sort of um, picks up the motif that um, of changing or guiding customer habits. Um, is it simpler to simply take the list of trajectories and then have an analysis team back calculate the factor table? Or can we work with our customers better, um, socialize some of those statistics and design of experiment um, concepts um, and slowly ingrain those behaviors um, into our customer relations to form a new habit? Uh, the second assertion option number one makes um, is that the Monte Carlo technique is rigorous and has high test coverage, um, but it's inefficient. So where applicable, um, skipping the Monte Carlo technique is preferred. Um, option number two relates to subsampling in Smart UQ and how either the Max Pro or Maximin functions can be utilized to identify the most interesting trajectories out of the 725 using a space filling optimization algorithm. Um, the results in the analyst no longer needing to run the low fidelity model at the start. Um, so if we're to zoom out uh, on this option and kind of look at it from the top down, really this allows analysts to um, work within their program parameters a little bit more effectively. So for example, being able to um, you know, select an affordable number of runs very quickly. Um, it is really the, where the benefit of this one comes into play. Um, option number three also creates a surrogate using SmartUQ's functional response emulator. So the inputs could either be from the customer or from JMP functional response components. Um, we then have a um, set of outputs before the functional response emulator builds a time-based model from the trajectories where the functional principal components, um, where the FPCs, I'll call them going forward, um, define the curves. Um, from there, we get into the sensitivity analysis, um, where the functional response emulator successfully back calculated the sensitivities um, by looking at the main effects and total effects on the screen. Um, we were able to determine things like um, the wind affecting the initial ascent from roughly time one to seven. Um, cruise variability is the main effect during the two cruise periods. So that's roughly time 7 to 15 and 25 to 30. Um, and then atmospheric conditions and material density have an effect throughout. Um, once again, if we were to zoom out on this option, um, sort of bottom, bottom line it, um, the functional response emulator does require both input and output values. So that's something that an analyst would uh, like need to take into consideration um, before advancing with this option, but it was successful um, and a significant opportunity for improvement in this case. <clears throat> uh, to revisit our home base for a second, um, we're now good at getting into um, options four through seven. So below that blue line, no longer working with a factor table as a direct or an immediate input. Um, and I hope it becomes clear here in a second. Um, you can kind of see how they, the inputs and outputs go diagonally. So the, the outputs of the preceding option will kind of be the inputs for the next option, if that makes sense. Um, so option number four functions to ingest the Monte Carlo technique um, in order to generate the um, functional principal component or FPC values using JMP's functional data explorer. Uh, so JMP first allows the user to visualize each trajectory, align and adjust the data, evaluate the number of knots, adjust the knots, and then diagnose the accuracy of the splines. Um, so with the understanding that um, we kind of looked at each of those curves, separated them into pieces, um, and then approached the question of number of knots, 
with the understanding that um, knots are landmarks or defining characteristics enough to group in the data. And we determined that roughly five knots would be a justifiable decision um, since that uh, threshold still holds a reasonable BIC value. <clears throat> uh, we don't gain as much after the five knot mark. Um, and of course, increasing the number of knots means um, increased difficulty, more computing, et cetera. Um, from there, this option advances into functional component analysis, where it turns our now um, grouped and adjusted data um, into spline curves and then generates the functional principal component or FPC values. Um, once the analyst identifies the number of FPC values to be obtained, in this case, there are seven. Um, and really, this op option um, is beneficial or significant in that it translates um, some of our really previously hard to use, um, or kind of like less tangible curves into numbers, which for a lot of the areas in which analysts are concerned about um, is simply a little bit more um, digestible. Um, option number five then um, takes in those FPC values in order to back calculate the factor table. And this is first done through principal component analysis formula generation, um, where the analyst would select the model um, and shapes to serve as a basis um, and subsequently flow into um, the formula. And you can see the, the skeleton formula for that is at the bottom of your screen. Um, from, the, from there, uh, we're able to obtain the FPC factor table. Um, and it's important to note that um, the FPC factor table is equivalent to the engineering factor table. Um, so we can set them equal to each other um, and technically use them interchangeably. But it's not lost that um, the engineering factor table for many, unless there's a statistics background, that is simply going to be um, a lot easier to understand. And on the note of um, kind of working within digestible information, the engineering factor table does tend to be a little bit more digestible. Um, option six then takes in those FPC values in order to um, obtain a space filling test design. Um, so this is first done using the DOE generator. Let's say it picks um, you know, 80 really interesting runs before prompting the analyst to select a model um, to influence that space filling test design. In this case, we'll look at the RSM um, and powers models. Um, that choice of model um, to Karen's point here really goes into um, sort of program requirements and whether there is more of a need to explore the space as on the right hand side of your screen, um, exploit the space as with the RSM model on the left hand side of your screen, um, or a combination of both as with the powers model. Um, so choosing this model, um, as I mentioned, definitely um, relies heavily on specific program requirements or the challenge uh, at play. Um, but it's an important choice because that information will um, sort of be appended to the FPC factor table as we gather more information throughout this analysis process. Um, but it is um, kind of a step that you can play around with and it's adjustable which is important to know. Okay. Uh, last but not least, option number seven um, then takes in that space filling test design in order to obtain a surrogate trajectory model. So the analyst would generate a 40 run, let's say, um, space filling design for high fidelity model runs. Um, and then there is a fork in the road. The first pathway being to either augment those 40 runs with 260 more for 300 total low fidelity model runs, and the second pathway being augment to 340 and use the new runs as low fidelity and add to the high fidelity runs. So the result in those two pathways um, really relates to sort of the, the old school methodology um, as opposed to the new school methodology of making sure that we have a mixture of fidelities um, and that we're comparing our models and surfaces throughout. Um, so to wrap up, I wanted to revisit the decoder ring graphic um, and reiterate that um, there are opportunities for improvement throughout the entire analysis process. 
Um, and the seven options that we detailed um, can be used individually or um, in conjunction with one another, depending on the specific challenge claim. Um, but in this case, it did help us um, approach our ultimate vision or goal of obtaining the best map of the 725 trajectories with a combination of low and high fidelity models, um, as well as generating a surrogate. Um, so with that, I'd like to thank you for your time um, and open up for questions. We do have time for questions. Um, so you had this nice um, kind of layout about the analysis flow. Um, in terms of OT, what we care a lot about is um, the validation and verification of the model with the live test data. So is there a point in that flow you think that taking data from live shots or using the model in live shots is best fit in terms of the different parts of the analysis? Um, I think that'd be a good next step if I were to expand on this talk or this presentation. Incorporating that in um, would be best here. Anybody else? I have a question. Um, so can you go back to the, um, the uh, you were talking, you were talking about the FPC factor table and um, the engineering factor table, and you were saying that they were equivalent, um, but you made that good point about one making a little bit more sense. Like, does the FPC factor table have real units in, in anything? I mean, like, do units fall out of that at all uh, um, that, that have any meaning? Like, like in the way that um, I... I assume that atmospheric pressure has units of pressure, so. <laughs> Yet, um, to my best understanding, um, yes. So the F, um, FPC factor table um, sort of normalizes the information that we've already worked with um, and sort of assigns um, the factor table that we previously worked in, the engineering factor table, which of course, like you said, you know, pressure has units, um, you know, even our wind velocity has units and stuff like that. Um, and, and make sure that we're um, really looking at the data in relation to each other and normalizing it over time. Okay. So, um, so, so the the values on the FPC factor table are, are still comparable values. They're just normalized on a different scale than the ones on the left. I believe so. Yes. Um, you have me thinking about it, though. So I no. Uh, let me let me think on that, and I'll get back to you. Perfect. Thank you. Um, any other questions? Right. Well, then we'll take one more time.